to introduce tonight's speaker, we'd like to welcome Kathleen Rowena, uh, Program Director of Dana Education at the Dana Foundation. Thank you, Margaret and Dorian, for the introduction. And thank you, our audience, uh, for joining us for tonight's presentation. Uh, we're so excited to be here in person for actually the first time since 2019. Yay! <laughs> so it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Xiaoxi Gu, um, to discuss her fascinating work studying human beliefs and the social brain. Dr. Gu is a professor of psychiatry and neuroscience and the director of the Center for Computational Psychiatry at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Her research examines the neural and computational mechanisms underlying human beliefs, emotions, decision-making, and social interactions in both health and disease through a synthesis of neuroscience, cognitive science, and behavioral economics. She uses a variety of technologies, including brain imaging and machine learning, to study the brain's processes with the goal of improving general knowledge about the brain as well as psychiatric treatments. She is the co-developer of the Social Brain app, which uses games and participatory narratives to measure the relationship between social behaviors and mental health. And now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Xiao Si Gu. All right, that's my title and also the title of the talk. Okay, so we're here to talk about brains, but before I you know, start talking about brains, I want to talk about cars. Okay, who's a car lover here? No? <laughs> Got it, that's why you live in New York City. <laughs> um, anyway, please allow me to introduce to you this beautiful car called the uh, Model T uh, by Ford, right? And here is the uh, you know uh, famous Henry Ford who designed this car with with his team in the, almost a century ago. And I think this car was very was a big hit at the time, not only because of its beauty and its power, but for a very important reason: for its price. It's got an amazing price. So it turns out that a century ago, most people lived like New Yorkers, right? They didn't have cars. They couldn't afford cars. Cars were very expensive at the time. Actually, most cars cost costing over $1,000, which is over roughly over $30,000, $35,000 today, which was a huge amount for a regular person. But through sort of Ford's innovation in his management and sort of design techniques, he managed to cut down the cost of this beautiful car to only um, 800, and over the next couple of years, it was lowered even uh, by more than half, right? So down to the 400, 500 range. That was a big breakthrough at the time. And the way he did that was through very, very sort of careful selection of parts and materials, right? Cutting down every penny, really. So there's a famous story which says that Henry Ford would send his men, send his workers to a, uh, a junkyard of cars, identify which car parts were still shiny and not worn in the junkyard and come back and tell him. So in the next iteration of the car, he would then use inferior materials to cut down the cost just so that that particular, body, uh, that particular car part will not outlast the rest of the car. This is how he cut down the cost. Okay, very smart guy. And the point of bringing up this story is just to say that actually nature is just as stingy and scrappy as Henry Ford. So th this is very well said by a uh, psychologist named uh, Nicholas Humphrey from the 1970s, nature is surely at least as careful as an economist as Henry Ford. It is not her habit to tolerate needless extravagance in the animals on her production lines, right? Humans included. And that tells us that 
the brain, and here we're, he we're here to talk about the human brain, is only as complex as it needs to be shaped by our environment. So the complexity and all the amazing features that you, you have, your brain has right now, are actually shaped or have already been trimmed down by the environment. Because for humans, ultimately, our world is not just, is much more than a natural world, right? It's primarily a social world. I hope this message sort of stays with you tonight because I'm gonna bring you a few pieces of evidence just to show you why I'm making this claim that the human brain is in essentially inherently social. We have a lot of evidence from very different disciplines, actually beyond my own research field. For example, this is one sort of cross-species study where scientists discovered that uh, the complexity of our brain um, is highly correlated with the complexity of our social network sizes. So here you can compare humans with a few um, our closest cousins, including this is a squirrel monkey, and this is macaque, and also here are chimpanzees. You see that these animals have relatively well-developed social networks, right? They're fairly complex. The living groups, they have, you know, prosocial behavior. They have sort of complex social hierarchies. But again, even compared to all of them, humans have the most complex and the most sort of convoluted uh, social network as demonstrated by this graph here. And if you pick one brain feature, right, again, there are many features you can pick, but here I'm showing you one that is uh, what's called the relative neocortex volume, so it's basically the volume of your cortex, uh, which is kind of the surface part of your brain. Um, so this index is highly correlated uh, with the group size of that species. You can see humans are all the way up there, right? We have the sort of, we don't have the biggest brain itself, but we have the, you know, uh, the biggest relative neocortex volume compared to these other non-human primates. Um, and, you know, which is highly correlated with our large sort of group size. Another way to look at this is to just focus on the human brain, but across time, right? And this is, again, some really amazing work done by scientists who have been able to reconstruct the human brain from like fossils and archeological work. And you can see that um, actually, oh, this is a human brain or what a human brain might have looked like from two, two, uh, 300,000 years ago and this is what the brain looks like today. And the green shade here kind of represents uh, the part of the brain that have gone through like the most expansion. Um, you can see here that this is again mostly sort of in these cortical areas that we know, right? So prefrontal cortex and your, your temporal cortex, temporal lobe and uh, parietal lobe as well as occipital lobe, right? Some visual areas in the back. So kind of taken together, this tells us that your brain today, or we as a species, our brains today, collectively, are actually very different from the average human brain from hundreds of thousands of years ago. And you can imagine why, right? Again, our brain is really shaped, or it's driven by the environment, by the primary survival needs of that era. So, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago, clearly we're still fighting dragons or monsters, uh, you know, trying to just get food, right? So our daily activities and goals are mostly about avoiding danger and foraging, right? And there are no, there's no industrial sort of production of food or shelter or even tools yet at the time. And we have to do a lot of physical labor to achieve that. Versus today, right? I, I assume many people here probably have managed to uh, meet their basic survival needs such as even food or water met um, during COVID, for example, right? Through your navigation of abstract and very complex human networks. And a lot of us work in these environments too, right? So, you know, 
you earn money, you get promotions, you use that to you know, exchange of food or housing or transportation, and that's all done through actually just navigating through complex human relationships. So our real reality is completely different today. And just to put this into context, here's a very nice summary. Uh, so it's a review paper uh, published quite a while ago already, but just to show the parts of the brain that have been implicated in different aspects of social functions, right? Again, compare this with this, you'll see that there is a lot of overlap, right? Primarily sort of in our cortical areas. Okay. So our agenda today is to sort of give you like a sampler, right? Because again, s the social brain is a very vast topic. You know, we have very complicated social relationships. There, you know, there's competition versus cooperation. There is uh, pro-social versus anti-social. Um, there's affiliation versus power. There are many dimensions we can describe our social relationships on. But I'm gonna use this very sort of rough division, right? To divide the social brain into this hot part or the more affective or emotional part where we talk about feelings and you know, things like empathy or unfairness versus what we, call, what we call the cold cognition, right? So these are the more sort of strategic parts of our social relationships where we need to learn how to behave, you know, like in a situation like this, you don't wanna be the only one standing in the room while all the people around you are uh, sitting if you are you know, near a seat. Uh, social norms, how do we learn and adapt to social norms? And, and more recently, my lab has focused a lot on this new topic called social controllability, right? This has a lot to do with our sort of collective existential sort of crisis, that sense that maybe our social environment is, a is getting a little out of control these days. And finally, I'm gonna wrap everything together to show you how different aspects of the social brain uh, might relate to mental health. Okay, so the first topic um, is empathy. And this is actually something I started that got me really into neuroscience when I was still an undergrad. And I sort of spent a good portion of my earlier career researching this. What is empathy, right? You know, I'm not gonna read you the text, but I'm gonna play you this video. Very well said by this man here. Uh, <laughs> To oppose her, to all those who say that there's no place for empathy on the bench, I say this, I completely understand how you're feeling. <laughs> when you're upset, I'm upset. Okay, there you go. Who knew that Obama was a neuroscientist? He just said the definition of empathy very, very clearly in a very succinct way. So the ability to feel other people's feelings, that if you're upset, I'm upset. If you're happy, I feel your happiness, right? That shared emotion, that shared sort of affective experience is really important for human beings. But it's not unique to human beings because, again, there's a lot of cross-species work that have shown many other species at least show signs of empathy, right? And it's considered a precursor to prosocial or altruistic behaviors, right? Of course, you don't necessarily have to feel another person's pain to, uh, you know, to be pro-social. You can just, for example, donate money without really feeling the pain of those in need, but you could, right? And in many cases, I think for a lot of people, that is a precursor to their helping behavior. All right. Um, okay, so the real world is much more interesting than our dry, boring laboratory studies. <laughs> This is actually how we study empathy in the lab. And I don't know if you recognize, but it's actually my hand here. <laughs> so this was one of the earliest studies I did as a, when I was still a PhD student, where I was essentially tasked with making like a set of images to induce pain in the viewer, right? Uh, don't worry about it. Clearly my hand is still fine. It's just about the angle. <laughs> um, but 
but we chose empathetic pain because it's, it's a, it turned out to be a very effective type of stimulus, right? Because again, when you see this, you can almost immediately feel that cringe that, oh my gosh, that really hurts. And what we found is that when we show a, you know, a group of what we call healthy controls, right? Just sort of you know, adults with no psychiatric conditions, uh, primarily students actually in this study, uh, we found that just viewing these painful images, right, and contrasting them with the non-painful ones, it engaged a circuitry in the brain, right? So this is called the insular cortex, and here, this blob here is called the anterior cingulate cortex, and it turns out that these brain regions are part of a circuitry that also process pain uh, in the self. So if I, you know, give you, I don't know, like electrical shock, or um, you know, have other modalities of pain sort of administered to you, it turns out that the similar uh, neural circuitry will be activated in the brain. This is very interesting, right? Because that tells us that there is a biological substrate that shares this sort of affective experience between the self and the other. And what's even more interesting is that we can find groups of patients who have undergone sort of brain surgeries and to remove tumor in different brain parts. So they also lo lose kind of that part of the brain as a result. They can mostly function and survive, but they have very subtle sort of behavioral differences. Um, so we found that if you essentially knock out this brain area, right, in this group of patients who happen to, you know, um, you know have lost this brain part, that they show reduced ability to detect other people's pain. So it's quite fascinating, right? So, so not only now we know the insular cortex is activated, but actually it's also necessary in sort of helping us detect other people's pain. So that's one set of findings that suggests that, again, there are shared biological substrates in the brain that processes our own pain and others' pain. So this could be, you know, again, a hypothesis, uh, a hypothesis that this could be an evolutionarily developed mechanism uh, because, you know, we survive as groups. So when, when we detect another person's pain and we feel that pain, it's kind of an immediate teaching signal to us that maybe there's danger going on. Maybe we need to help our conspecific, right? And, or maybe we need to do something else. So this is ultimately helpful for survival for the entire species or the group in the long term. Okay, another concept I wanna talk about is unfairness. So it's a, again, very touchy topic these days. We know the society you know, has a lot of unfairness going on. And how do we study that in the lab, right? So for this, we rely on uh, a particular approach called behavior economics. So it's the branch of economics that if you are into sort of frequent economics, you probably know there's a lot of behavioral econ theories and studies have been talked about on the, on the show. But basically, behavioral econ is the branch of econ that really focuses on individual behavior, right? Instead of trying to understand the society as a whole system and how Inflation might be due to different factors. Here we zoom in on individual economic decision-making behavior and try to really understand primarily human irrationality, really. So reaction to unfairness is kind of considered like a irrational uh, sort of choice by economists traditionally, right? So in this particular game, I'll explain what I mean. In this particular game called the ultimatum game, um, you have two players, so one is the proposer, the other one is the responder. And in most cases, the subject or our research participant is the responder. So a proposer will come to you and say, I have a total of $20, I'm gonna give you $6 out of 20, I'll keep 14, right? And you can say yes or no, accept or reject. Okay, so who's gonna accept this offer? Very rational, great. <laughs> Only a few very rational people here, 
I guess New Yorkers have very strong sort of feelings about unfairness, right? <laughs> OK, so I assume most of you will say no, which is fine. Uh, but if you reject, what if I say this? If you reject this offer, the deal is off. Actually, neither of you will get anything. So if you say no to six, the proposer, you know, very angry, walks off. Nobody gets anything. OK, now let me see another round of raise of hands. So now who's going to accept? More? Wow, OK, great. <laughs> it's a very strong economic incentive there. <laughs> yep. OK, so now we're increased to half-half. This is exactly what we observe in our experimental studies across many cultures and many settings. Around uh, 25 to 30 percent of the total amount, actually, you'll be really surprised. So around you know, five or six dollars out of 20 is what we call the indifference point, which means about half of the people will accept and the other half will say no. And you know, for those who actually said yes, you must be thinking, of course, I made the right choice, right? Why would other people you know, respond uh, with a rejection? Well, let's look at another set of results before we get to the answer. Right, so here's a very famous study conducted, again, in the early 2000s by a neuroscientist called Alan Senfei. And here, he let human players play with either humans or a computer agent. So this changes the dynamic again because overall you'll see, right, so, so the y-axis here is acceptance rate and the x is the offer size. So the, as the offer becomes sort of uh, less fair, right, so it's nine versus one, acceptance, uh, you know, declines. That's, that's true for both conditions, the human and the computer condition. But the major difference here is that for the human co condition, the slope is much steeper, right? For the computer condition, actually, even for a very unfair offer, uh, a lot of humans, actually majority of them still accept it which is really striking because what's the difference here? You know, why does it matter if it's a computer who gave you the offer versus a human gave you the offer? So, so I think keeping this in mind, this really kind of tells us that there's this very unique aspect about interacting with a human that I think we tend to assign meaning or intention to another human being, right? That you might be thinking that person is treating me very unfairly, right? Is that by chance? Is it, do they really mean harm? Do they, I don't know, don't think I'm worthy? You can engage a lot of these very social uh, mental processes, right? Versus if you just play with a slot machine or a computer, you might not engage in those you know, mental processes. So that have been sort of hypothesized to contribute to these differences we observed here. But how about what's going on in the brain, right? So we kind of turn to, you know, one, again, one of my favorite approaches in neuroscience, which is lesion studies, where we recruited two groups of people, and one group with uh, this uh, lesion in this part of the brain called the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, or VMPFC, and then the other um, group, again, with insular lesions, right? A brain region that we already saw in our previous slide. So two separate groups, right? One group only had insular lesion and the other group only had a VMPFC lesion. Both brain, region, brain regions have been considered to be important for this uh, social game. And again, very interestingly, what we found is that <clears throat> now we're plotting their responses as a function of their office size again, right? So re again, rejection is a different way of plotting, but it's the same idea rejection rate sort of declines as the offer becomes more fair. So, so we kind of reversed it. But you can see that for most other groups here, that is the case, right? For, so we are, we are very sensitive to unfairness or fairness. If the offer becomes more fair, you know, we tend to reject less and less and less, right? That's true for you know, most other control groups, including the group with insular lesions but not this group. You can see that here, it's very flat. These are the patients with VMPFC lesions. So they basically act actually the most rational, according to economists, <laughs> right? 
they are rejecting very little across the board. They don't respond. They're just like, they don't care about the unfairness here, right? And they're rejecting basically around 20, 30% across the board. Um, so that's a very interesting finding because that suggests that it is this part of the brain, again, the prefrontal, part of the prefrontal cortex called the VMPFC, but not the insular cortex, the part of the brain that I just told you about that detects pain and empathetic pain is necessary for detecting unfairness. It also turns out that this brain part is uh, critical for like just conducting valuation, like it knows kind of the, you know, it evaluates or encodes economic values. So it's potentially sort of detecting unfairness via its role in valuation, right? Okay, I'm going to switch gear a little bit and talk about now the more strategic parts of our brains, right? How do we adapt to norms and how do we sort of, you know, uh, learn to exert influence or controllability in our social environment? So first of all, social norms. Okay, um, so I actually just came back from the trip in London, to London, so this is still very uh, close. And in fact, I had lived in London many years ago for a number of years. And in those years, I was completely fine when I crossed the street. But now, moving back to the States for a, a n number of years, this is one of the you know, first trips I took abroad, I was completely out of my comfort zone, right? I was constantly checking, frantically checking which way am I supposed to be looking, right? So complete, you know, social norms are very different in different cities. Uh, it can be very different in different states, even if you are traveling through the United States. Uh, it can clearly be very different across, you know, continents and countries. And, but just the fact that we can relatively quickly learn the local rule or whatever the social norm is locally. And then when we come back from our trips, we can adapt back to our sort of the usual self, right? Whatever you're used to here tells us that maybe there's a very dynamic process going on in the brain that help us learn these social rules. To study that in the lab, again, is very difficult. Um, and we sort of go back to our favorite game, the ultimatum game. But now we change it up a little bit. So instead of playing with just a one person, you are playing with a sequence of people and you can observe essentially the possible range of these offers. Okay, now what goes through your head might be very different, right, from just a moment ago. Because you probably still, you know, are thinking I deserve uh, absolute fair share, you know, 50-50, 10 out of 20. But once you observe that everybody's being pretty nasty today to you, unfortunately, right? They're giving you ones and twos and threes, you probably need to adjust your belief, right? You shouldn't still be expecting, you know, the world will always give you, you know, tens or eights or nines. And so this is kind of the version of the game we use for uh, studying social norm adaptation. And we can recruit subjects in the lab, sort of record their behavior responses to these, you know, of course, manipulated or designed offer sequences. And interestingly, what we found through mathematical modeling, and actually, again, you know, you don't have to really understand what this says here, but just to show you that each line here represents a mathematical model that actually represents a hypothesis about what we think or how we think the human mind works in this case, right? Are they updating uh, trial by trial? Are they updating the entire distribution of offers? Do they come in with different initial expectations or do they all come in with exactly the same initial expectation? And long story short, our data suggests that humans so the first model is so-called the winning model, meaning that it best explains our data. Um, translating to a narrative, it suggests that humans can dynamically update our expectations, actually very dynamically, from trial to trial. 
and adjust our choices accordingly based on the social situation, right? If you're in a relatively sort of generous environment, you're dealing with very nice, warm people, your expectations are a little higher, you know? You are expecting sevens and eights and nines versus if you're in a group of, you know, less generous uh, sort of partners, you will adjust your expectation to a lower level. That's basically what it means. And interestingly, using the same group of patients that we just, just described earlier, again, patients with either insula or uh, VMPFC lesions, we found that now the insula patients show a very specific deficit in their what's called adaptation rate or how fast they are able to adjust their social expectations, right? So uh, they are these sort of uh, the red bars here. So each bar is actually a patient. And compared to the other groups, this group collectively show reduced ability, like a slower adaptation to changing sort of social norms. Okay, that tells us that the insula in this particular study uh, was also necessary for norm adaptation. Okay, finally, moving on to one of my recent favorite topics in social neuroscience, which is controllability. Um, like I said, you know, what really inspired this line of work is really all the social events that we've collectively had as a society, right? We know that humans as our demonstrations or protests as a way to voice our opinions with the hope that we can make a change in the world. However, not all protests and not all demonstrations and not all activism eventually will materialize, right? You might even say that in most cases it doesn't. And a big factor there is the social environment you are in, right? Are you in a, you know, if you're living in a dictatorship, clearly, you know, protests are, may not be like the best way to cause social, social change, but versus if you're in a democratic society where, you know, uh, we know dem demonstrations and protests are effective, then this could be a way, right? So it depends on the level of controllability of your social environment. You may want to adapt your strategy accordingly. So how do we, how do we, how does the brain processes, uh, process social controllability, right? How do we use our actions to influence others? Turning back to our favorite game again, but now adding up just a bit more flavor to it. So now we tell our participants they're playing with two different teams or two different groups of people. We don't really tell them anything else other than the rule, the same ultimatum game rule. You accept if this happens, you reject if this happens. And they have to figure out what goes on once they you know, make a choice, accept or reject. There is a ripple effect in one of the conditions or with one of the groups. And that's what we call the controllable condition in which by rejecting an offer, you are sending a social signal to that group, yeah, right? You are saying that I'm not happy with $6 or $5, I want more. So the group actually would respond and subsequent offers will increase by one, zero, one or two. So it'll increase in a probabilistic fashion. But if you accept an you know, offer of five or six, that is also a social signal, right, to your partners. And they might think that you're happy with that. That's why you accepted. So the next offers actually will start to decline. You know, it'll, it'll drop the offer gradually, you know, by zero, one, or two, again, in a probabilistic way, right? We, we try to make it a little harder for the subjects so they don't just immediately figure this out. But we also have a, what's called the uncontrollable condition where the offer is actually completely randomized so whatever you do, that's kind of like equivalent to a dictatorship, right? So whatever you do, it doesn't really matter. And you really kind of have to figure out which condition you are in. Are you in a dictatorship? Are you in a sort of a democracy, right, <laughs> sort of situation? Again, nothing was really instructed to the subjects. They have to figure this out by themselves. And to sort of play this game, you have to just keep a few things in mind now because all of a sudden, your reputation really matters, right? You might really want to accept something like a $5, but once you've learned 
accepting right now is not smart. It's like taking a low job offer, right? Um, you want to build a reputation of being expensive, I suppose. Um, so you, you want to play a little hard to get, <sighs> sort of like dating too, right? However, not too hard, because every no you are saying right now, that's a, a, a foregone reward, right? An opportunity is gone, is gone, okay? You are still kind of losing the money in the moment, although you are potentially gaining more reward in the future. Okay, so it's kind of a complex game. Let's just see how real subjects play this game. Very interestingly, they seem to be, you know, really be able to get it, right? So again, without any explicit instruction, and we start everyone with this indifference point at $5. Um, across time, across, you know, simply just a number of trials, subjects overall were able to raise these offers, you know, to like on average to a pretty decent amount, around uh, 6.5 or 7 to $7, compared to this uncontrollable condition, right, where the offers just randomly fluctuate. And we also asked the subjects to rate how much control they felt they had, just subjectively. And this is kind of, you know, consistent with their behavior. So they did decent, right, although not not really great, not the best they can do, but they did, did decent. And you can see that here, on average, people also reported they had a stronger sense of control in the C, which is the controllable condition, compared to the uncontrollable condition. But there's huge individual differences there, right, which we can you know, really explore um, in our sort of clinical uh, studies. And we hypothesized that most humans, the way that they succeed in this game is to engage a process called forward thinking. Again, you know, to replay this game a little bit, when you are playing the person right now, you really have to think what this interaction um, might mean for your next interaction, right? This ripple effect. This is really, really similar to the game of chess. You know, um, it's interesting, my, my six-year-old is learning how to play chess now. I can see that there's very similar flavor in my experimental paradigm and actually the teaching because it's all about thinking about potential future moves of your opponent, right? And try to come up with as many as effective branches in this tree as possible. So actually memory is a big part of this because you have to be able to remember the different outcomes and different paths. But of course, training and strate strategic thinking are also both very important. So again, very famous said by the same psychologist that uh, social exchange, right? We're talking about strategic social interactions really are always like a kind of, you know, uh, chess playing. And successful players usually have very sort of long forward thinking into the future. And it turns out that we can, again, use mathematical tools to write down uh, sort of the value of each step and the potential branches of this mental tree one might be able to move out. And even the probability for you to transition from one move to the next. Not going to show the equations today, and you have to trust me on this. <laughs> We've collected now actually thousands of people's data on this game, and it's quite consistent. We can, again, set up different mathematical models that involve different steps of forward thinking, and let the data tell us what is what do people use, right? And it turns out that on average, again, not it doesn't apply to every single individual because there are definitely you know. Uh, longer term thinkers versus shorter term thinkers, but on average, it seems like people are using what's called a two-step uh, model. So we're thinking about not just today, but also tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, right? So two steps ahead. Seems to be sufficient in, succeed, in succeeding in this game. We again used, um, here actually, sorry, not instead of using lesion, we used a technique called functional MRI, right? Uh, it's a whole brain imaging method that allows us to sort of record the activities in the brain while human subjects play this game. 
And we found that, again, a very familiar region, the VMPFC here, seems to be projecting this uh, value along our decision tree, right? Seems to be, again, like, you know, very overlapping regions as we observed before. Okay, so actually very quickly, I covered uh, a few topics that are being studied in my lab and also many other people's labs in the world of social neuroscience, right? That's the official term. Um, and we're now going to try to present to you a few examples of how very different sort of consequences or relationships between um, the social brain and different mental health conditions. So when I think about, when, when you think about social deficits, uh, when we all think about the primary disorder related to social deficits, maybe the first thing that jumps to your head is autism, right? Or uh, autism spectrum disorder, ASD. It happens, seems to be happening, you know, pretty frequent these days, uh, partially because we have better diagnosis. Uh, one out of every 44 children is now diagnosed with ASD. Uh, boys are about four times more likely than girls to have a diagnosis of ASD. And again, uh, one of the sort of the uh, hallmark sort of deficits are really social and communicative uh, difficulties. So for this particular um, group, we've so far <coughs> primarily focused on sort of their basic affective component, although we do have other projects going on um, about a normal adaptation and social controllability. So here I'm gonna show you the example from uh, the study on empathy. We use exactly the same stimuli as I showed you before, you know, with people's body parts in painful or non-painful situations, ask them to evaluate if they thought it was painful or not. Not surprisingly, right? At the behavioral level, we did see that ASD as a group showed reduced sort of discriminability or you know, they're less able to accurately detect pain in other people. Right? Not, not, maybe not very surprisingly. Um, however, what's really fascinating is that in this study we were able to record both their brain responses as well as their skin conductance responses simultaneously. And so contrary to my own prediction, and maybe to some your predictions too, is that instead of showing reduced responses, the ASD group actually showed increased response in their skin conductance uh, compared to you know, non-ASD healthy controls. And when you compare that to the brain response, we actually see exactly, almost uh, exactly the same direction. So instead of sh having deficits, right, not having enough sort of substrates in the brain to detect other people's pain, they show the opposite, right? They actually showed greater activation to others' pain. So it took us a while to sort of try to make sense of this finding because what does that, does that mean? You know, do they have more empathy actually after all? Um, and you also probably know that there are many, uh, several other groups that show sort of empathy deficits. A notable example would actually be psychopaths, right? So if you run the same task in psychopaths, um, they would also have reduced empathetic responses, but both behaviorally and at the brain level. So here, in contrast to that, I think what is going on here is that there is actually sort of higher arousal so sort of more anxiety associated with seeing others' emotional states, right? Of course, we haven't tested others being in positive affective states yet. You know, what if we showed other people in joy or, you know, happiness, right? But at least in the sort of the miserable domain, right? When they see other people in pain, there is this greater brain and skin activation, basically that essentially tells us there is more arousal potentially due to anxiety and unable to translate these biological responses into a behavioral reaction. And that actually gives us some hope, right, in the sense that maybe we can find strategies to help people cope with their anxiety and 
to train them and assign meaning to these social events, so help them make that translation happen. Yes, so reduced accuracy yet actually heightened brain responses related to em empathetic pain in ASD. So another example I want to show you here is um, a very different dimension, so OCD or obsession compulsion, right? So again, you know, OCD is actually quite common, or especially as a trait, it's more common than you think. And we can map out, we actually uh, surveyed over a thousand people, and you can sh see that there is a pretty nice sort of bell curve distribution of our collective OCD traits, right? It's really a trait. And these are not clinical patients. And so what we did is we picked like the top 75%, and then you know, and then also the bottom, right? So people with very high versus relatively low uh, OCD traits and ran um, one of these tasks. So this is the ultimatum game again. And one thing that jumped out in this set of analysis was that individuals with higher obsessive compulsive traits actually had much higher aversion to norm violation so again, you know, this took us by surprise just a little bit because OCD is considered usually, let's just say a non-social disorder, right? You know, you, you kind of, you wash your hands compulsively, you check things compulsively, but there has been a lot of theories about why people do that. So one of the theories is that that maintains some sort of order and it kind of keeps, reduces uncertainty around the world or in the environment. I think that might explain what we saw here is that when uh, things violate, especially when here the things are really people, when other people violate uh, expectations, individuals with higher OCD traits seem to uh, just have more aversion to that. A very different example now, sort of um, jumping around a little bit. We also uh, recently published a study to look at traits, again, these are all traits now, delusion, right? So delusional beliefs are fascinating topic, again, you know, very timely topic as well. Um, we sampled actually nationally, again, over a thousand individuals, and we chose, so it turns out that these are, again, they don't have psychosis or schizophrenia diagnosis, but there are a lot of people with score very high on this particular survey called the Peters Delusion Inventory. <laughs> we compared them with the individuals uh, that scored low on the survey. Again, something very interesting jumped out, which is that um, instead of showing deficits in the controllable, right? if you recall, the C stands for controllable condition, and the U is uncontrollable condition. So the, highly delusional individuals are, were okay. Like if the environment allowed them to have control, they can exert control, they're fine. But their deficits, it's, not the, it's the opposite of deficit, that they thought they had way more control than they should in this uncontrollable condition, right? When you should realize that the environment is not changeable <laughs> and people are not affected by you, your actions are not causing results in the world, right? But somehow they thought they had uh, much stronger sort of influence uh, than actually is. And that's expressed through both their behavior as well as their self-reported beliefs. Okay, illusion of control, that's what we call. Okay, finally, I just wanna sort of conclude on this sort of idea of the general mood, right? So, you know, whether you have high or low delusion or OCD or autism traits, Maybe it doesn't matter because fundamentally what really matters to us as any individual, right? Uh, whichever group you're, you fall in is your general mood. So how are you feeling? In one of the experiments that I described earlier, we again just surveyed and just collected data from like a general community sample. But we added a question. After a few couple of trials, we asked, how are you feeling? Or how do you feel about this last interaction? And it turns out that when uh, subjects played, again, with a human player, 
the so-called norm violation or when other, you know, or, or there's your social expectations of what other people should give you um, are being violated, right? That's what we call a prediction error signal. Um, that impact of the social prediction error signal on mood is far greater than if you played, again, with a non-social agent, like a computer agent, or if, it's, if the offers are being generated by a slot machine, right? So that, that says a lot. That means we really attribute a lot of our feelings, our internal subjective states, to other people as a whole. And I think that's probably, a, you know, again, an innate feature of uh, the human mind. Okay, I want to conclude by a very uh, old theory. Um, uh, a lot of you might have heard about it, called the Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. And at the bottom of this hierarchy, this pyramid, are really our physiological needs, right? We need food, water, uh, we want safety, we need shelter. Um, but actually the top, right, and really the mo more important needs at, for human beings are all social needs, right? Our need for self-actualization, of self-esteem, love and belonging relationships, right? All of that really matters and in many ways probably more important than the lower needs uh, in the contemporary world. So I think if we look back at the history of human evolution, um, I think we as a society have really primarily focused on our physical health, right? And we've, you know, we've been constantly fighting, improving um, our tools, our technique, our resources, right? So that we have enough food, and we have enough shelter, we have better cars and, you know, vehicles. We might be able to travel to the moon. And, but a lot of the sort of the physical health aspect, I think, have been, not to say we figured everything out, but just to say that they are well addressed, right? They are well recognized in the world. However, I think this top half of this pyramid really drives our mental health, and that need is still largely unaddressed, even in a very developed culture like the one we're in. I think, again, you know, promise not gonna mention COVID again, but COVID is a great example of that, where we primarily focused on dealing with saving lives from a physical disease, which of course was highly important. But right now what's going on clearly is that there is this lingering mental health pandemic that is affecting uh, lots of people. Uh, and it's just one of the examples, right? Of course, there are many other uh, sort of societal level events like I described that are having, you know, an impact on our mental health. It's probably time for us to collectively acknowledge that and start to do something about it. And I think hopefully today I convince you that we have some tools, right? Maybe not the best tools, not the best knowledge or theories, but we have some knowledge about it. And it's time to sort of pay attention to your brain, which is a social brain, and, and recognize the importance of that social brain to your own well-being. Okay, I want to stop here and just to thank you all for coming here today again. And this is my team, and a lot of this work is funded by the NIH, especially the National Institute of, of Mental Health, uh, as well as uh, NIDA and a few other foundations. And I'll take some questions and we'll social. <laughs>I just uh, so um, we're gonna take the mics around and if you guys could raise your hands up we will bring you a mic um, I'm down here okay. hi um, my question came early on so I've been like oh waiting no. <laughs> but um, you said something about how it's not really I don't want to put words in your mouth something along the lines of like caring about unfairness isn't really makes sense evolutionarily because we're kind of our brain is a bit lazy in the sense that I'm making some leaps, but effectively. So I mean, you made some references to politics, and and, and I think we're in a pretty progressive part of the country. And I kind of wonder, 
other than maybe like tribe feeling like a part of a tribe or maybe it's a selfishness that we just want a fair society but i kind of wonder is there any neuroscience about why do we care like are we like is the virtue sure. signaling to like show off who we are like i don't know like what neuroscience wise is driving yeah. caring yeah so the sort of the neuroscience work basically definitely shows that there are you know uh dedicated systems in your brain that care about fairness or unfairness so that's what our work and many others work have shown so far and I think going back to your first point, so what I was trying to say was that ac according to traditional e economics, um, rejecting those unfair offers did not make sense, right? Because you are losing money. Like anything should be better than zero, right? So you should be trying, you know, take all the non-zero offers and maximize your own profit. So that's kind of like the traditional Adam Smith type of thinking that we should all just be thinking about maximize, uh, maximizing our own profit. Clearly it's not that simple. And that's why that way of thinking, um, not to say is overthrown, but it's now complemented by these more nuanced behavioral economics theories that recognize, well, one is because we have these so-called so hot processes going on. So sometimes people just respond out of anger. Right. And we know that's also true in real life. You just see something super unfair, you jump on it out of anger. But there's also kind of the strategic part of it, like the long-term consequences of addressing unfairness, which actually led to our you know, social controllability experiment. Because there, by responding to an unfair offer, by rejecting, you are sending a signal with the hope that you can cause some change in the system, right? So it's kind of both ways, right? So you can kind of like, you know, see that there are things that happen at a very micro level, at an individual level, but also there are things that we have to sort of think about from a very strategic perspective. Yeah. Can I go? Sure. Right here. Uh, number one, we shouldn't forget the 2.5 or 3 billion human beings living in the world who don't have food to eat, uh, who are food insecure, they don't have health care. So we shouldn't look at it from our perspectives, but from their perspectives. But I have two questions. Number one, uh, I've wor I mean, read uh, Tversky and Kahneman and those guys, but there's a new field called neuroeconomics, and I'm really wary about it because of its potential for manipulation. So if you can say few words on that. And the second thing is, when you talked about the bell curve, uh, I don't know whether you read that book, the bell curve, like 20 something For, years ago. Uh, yeah, delusion as a trait, yeah. No, no, the bell curve is by Charles Murray, who, uh, so oh. there's an argument among scientists whether intelligence is a factor of environment or is, is it genetic? So what's the consensus right now? Because whenever you listen to Fox News, they have the different opinion and MSNBC has a different opinion. Mm -hmm. But is it based on genetics or only environment? Because that has a lot of consequences, like racial consequences, economic consequences. So. Yeah, thank you for your question. So these are really interesting points. Well, the first one, clearly, this, it's, I guess the point is not to uh, sort of undermine or you know, try to uh, you, know, uh, you know, like discard still the existing you know uh, needs for food safety or you know drinking water safety in many developing countries right um, and it's funny because i actually grew up in china like in the last stretch of a very poor sort of period in china where food was an issue and if you don't have your basic needs met clearly that's going to affect your mental health right um, and I think that the whole point, I think there are you know, experts on that topic, clearly. <laughs> um, that's out of my area of expertise. Uh, what I personally really care about is mental health. And I think that you can actually talk about mental health in any socioeconomic setting. Because even if you don't have, let's say, you know, the best food to eat, um, mental health, taking care of mental health is still very important. Your, 
latter question about intelligence, I think there are clearly theories about you know how social intelligence, for example, might be a ultimate form of intelligence. Um, I think a lot of these debates happened in the earlier history of psychology and neuroscience. Whereas these days, I think most neuroscientists are not too focused on trying to figure out which way is true because clearly biology and environment both play a role, right? And I would personally probably say that because human behaviors are mostly very complex and a lot of the behaviors that we have as humans are really learned, right? So, you know, I would say that environment definitely plays a very important role in there. But, you know, again, we all come into the world with, with, with very different biological substrates. Um. <laughs> there. Thank you. Um, um, my question is about... I. I am, <laughs> I am not a scientist, um, but I have worked in a lot of like supportive services roles. So I've worked in a lot of residential treatment centers. I am unfortunately intimately familiar with the status of the nation's substance abuse support system, which is to say sad. Um, it's not great. Uh, and I'm currently volunteering in a classroom teaching little kids social emotional learning skills. Yeah. Um, and so my question is, what do you, think the role, like all of this information is great and this room is full of obviously people who care, but how, what is a scientist's responsibility in disseminating this information further? Because in these roles, I'm encountering so many people that not only do they not know these things, they don't have access to these resources. So we talk about, you know, the next step is to do something about it. So what is the responsibility of the scientist in that, how do we connect more scientists to more social workers? Like, what are, where, how do we bridge this gap? How do we help more people? <laughs> yes, I feel your pain. <laughs> and first of all, thank you for doing what you do. Like, that's clearly very important. And I guess that's also why I'm here. So I try to do outreach events as much as possible as well, personally. It is very limited, clearly, uh, because, you know, <laughs> unless I do one every night, right? Um, but I think, generally speaking, you know, when we think about where we can exert our biggest impact, um, it really depends on the indiv individual. Like, if you're a clinician, for example, you know, I'm not a clinician scientist, so I can't even treat patients, right? I can study them, but I have to also collaborate with clinician colleagues to recruit the patients. Uh, so that's not an area where I can exert really my, you know, impact, but. You know, um, I think through education, I think that's a really big, big place. Education across all levels, you know, to the general public. Um, you know, through my own lab, I mentor a lot of, you know, grad students and also postdocs and junior scientists in my lab. They will then go on to mentor other people. But um, I think fundamentally, maybe for me, I think to do the best science I can do is probably the most efficient way, to be honest, and then try to disseminate right, that knowledge around. Because, you know, if we are very close, I mean, you know, we have a lot of more experimental things going on that I'm not sharing today, right, because there are a lot of maybe different ways of treatment or, you know, different ways of putting the right treatment for the right person at the right time, you know, that kind of thing they are happening with computational, you know, approaches with machine learning, a lot of these things we're doing combine behavioral data and imaging data and so on and so forth are eventually, I believe, going to help millions of people. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but I agree, you know, sometimes I also wish that there is this general sort of neuroscience education in our curriculum, like that, wouldn't that be great? Because, because why not? Like there's a lot of high schools who have neuroscience in their AP biology already. And very often I kind of go around in the city, I see a lot of miseries in the streets and in, or sometimes even how parents interact with the children. 
I kind of wanted to, you know, I don't want to be that parent to just go up and say, don't do that. <laughs> or, but, but you want to give people the tools they need, right? Maybe we'll do a podcast or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you so much for a really stimulating talk, and it's really interesting to think about the, the biological basis of our ability to feel for one another. Um, you touch briefly on, um, you call them psychopaths, sometimes we call them sociopaths, I'm a psychiatrist, and um, so I'm just wondering about, um, uh, is, is there a more research these days, do we understand um, sociopathy better? Um, these are people who have no ability to feel for other people, who cause a lot of pain in personal relationships, um, who cause a lot of unfairness in society, mm -hmm. um, and not to mention a huge burden on the criminal justice system. And, um, yeah. <laughs> So clearly, again, like I said, we all come into the world with very different biological substrates. And uh, I have not personally studied sociopaths. Uh, I was involved in a collaboration that studied children with so-called conduct disorders. So these are basically children with all sorts of behavior issues, very often aggression and lack of empathy for others. Many of them actually do develop sort of, uh, you know, sociopath symptoms or even become criminals later in life, right? Um, but, you know, I think that uh, whatever that biological substrate is, I think it's, again, you know, knowledge, ac access to knowledge is probably key because as teachers or parents, if you can spot certain, like, signs or behavioral traits that usually emerge quite early, maybe there is time to intervene, right? Because to say that there are biological differences is not to sort of acknowledge determinism. Be you know, I think, by the way, the brain is constantly changing all the time, right? Your brain is different from yesterday's and will be different from tomorrow. And, and that can be said, especially for children. They are going through such rapid changes in, you know, in all s parts of their body. The brain in particular is you know, it doesn't really stabilize. Brain growth and matu maturity do, do not stabilize until mid-20s. So there's lots of time to like intervene and to do therapy and early education and treatment. So, yeah. Oh, hi, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm, it's actually a very similar question, which you've answered a portion of already, um, so I don't wanna like take away too much time, but like, is there a, imaging overlap um, for psychopathy or psychopath um, to the two regions of the brain that you were specifically speaking to today. Um, and then the other question that's kind of attached to that is that while I don't have a lot of experience in, in studies of like legioned brains, <laughs> um, I know that there are just a lot of famous studies about people for instance, the construction worker that, that got a portion of his brain taken out was totally fine, except there's a huge change in his personality. I feel like a lot of those studies have a common uh, higher aggression, lower empathy rate generally. And I'm wondering if there's just like a, a correlation to brain mass and, and what is lost and how much of that is, is taken out to the correlation yeah. of empathy and, and everything you're speaking yeah. to. Yeah, again, the first question, there are published studies. Uh, there are a couple of research groups here uh, that actually have developed these MRI machines that can be driven around. So they would drive to prisons and scan like, you know, prisoners. And they did show, you know, some deficits in these parts of the brain. But again, it's hard to claim causality there, right? So that's the first one. The second question, uh, I would say, generally speaking, we don't think there is a correlation just between the amount of the brain you lose uh, versus a particular behavioral deficit. It's really about regional specificity, right? Like even in the one or two examples I showed you, there are very clear differences between two groups of patients who both have substantial brain lesion, but showed very different behaviors and very subtle behaviors. And also it's not, it's almost never just clearly always resulting in aggression or loss of empathy. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much for this. This is so interesting. Um, 
it kind of rela- my question kind of relates to something that someone asked earlier. But um, has your team or has anyone really studied the correlation between how you were raised? So if you were raised in like an abusive household, how that affects how you respond to these scenarios that you were testing? Yeah, yeah. I was waiting for someone to ask that question. Yes. So early childhood experience very important okay um there is a very high correlation between trauma especially early childhood trauma versus later adult mental health number one number two is that i can share with you some very preliminary result that we just uh, discovered um we we found a group of people who have basically survived extreme trauma when they were kids. So they, you know, again, through self-reports, but they scored very high on um, this survey that samples a lot of different types of childhood trauma, including emotional abuse, uh, sexual abuse, like physical violence, witnessing a family member being in prison, witnessing a family member having a psychiatric, you know, condition, you know, so on and so forth. So there's a very comprehensive list. And what we found is that Interestingly, not everybody, so although overall there's a correlation, but there is a small group of people who have gone through these trauma, but were doing very well later in adult life. And what we found is that this group, we call the resilient group, right? Um, They seem to have uh, a very high uh, norm adjustment rate in one of the games that I just showed kind of suggesting that they have a lot of like flexibility, um, both at the brain and the behavioral level, right? So that's fascinating because that's probably the only way you can come out of something like that and realize that that's your old reality and your new reality is very different and you have to just adjust your belief and kind of live the new life. So that's something that we kind of just discovered not peer reviewed or published yet, but I think there's a lot of really interesting work on the relationship between um, early childhood experience, trauma, and also socioeconomic status, of course, uh, in general. Um, yes, they have a very you know, big impact on somebody's um, you know, behavior and later mental health. I, I have a microphone. I'll talk. I have a microphone now. I don't know where my person went. Um, I, I just want to say, like, we're both social workers, so you've reached us uh, in terms of clinicians. Um, and I also just, this conversation's been fascinating, but I also just, like, want to point out, like, as a, from a clinician perspective, like, we bring our reality and reliability to the work that, like, in our, like, adaptability and perceptions to the work we do. So just, for example, talking about folks involved in the criminal justice system and uh, antisocial personality disorder, which is sort of known as psychopathy. Like, I know as a clinician, having worked in public mental health for 10 years, if I put that label in a chart and my client ever comes in contact with the criminal justice system, they're less likely to get bail, they're more likely to get an extended prison sentence, and they're less likely to have any type of diversion program. So our stigma in mental health and the way we think and even talk about it in rooms like this I think is really important because criminality is not a mental illness and it's also not solely impacted by uh, your environment. It's impacted by your circumstances, it's impacted by your race, where you live, your zip code, so many things like that. So I think we need to be careful when we're talking about that. Um, I also wanted to just make the point that like, Communicating like neuroscience foundational stuff about trauma to my traumatized client clients is some of the most healing work that I do. So I do really like appreciate this sort of access accessible science because it has been life changing for people that I've come in contact with. My question is about disseminating this information and sort of the way social media has done that. And in terms of like even like with like the Chat GPT stuff coming out like. How do you think apps, social media, AI is going to like impact the way that we as human beings like socially interact and how our brains develop? Yeah, that's a tough one. (laughs) 
So um, again, you know, social media definitely has drastically changed the human social network, right? And unfortunately, we are realities. Again, whatever you see and what you think to be reality is only whatever is being fed to you. <laughs> And it's controlled by the algorithm, which is then controlled by a few people, a, p a few powerful people in the world. And I think, um, so there are kind of a few flavors to this. One is that I think, again, just to give a positive spin, I think we still do need to acknowledge that the existence of social media has changed people's access to information. It has given people from actually, you know, um, you know, developing countries, for example, or underserved uh, backgrounds, access to information that they might have never had before. And also all of us, right? The way, you know, that you can easily follow somebody who is all the way across the world, um, that has been amazing. But of course, I think the downside is that, um, it's clear <laughs> that um, we are being kind of, divided into these echoing chambers. And, you know, as a social neuroscientist myself, I mean, I, I don't really have better strategy than all of you, uh, other than saying that I'm trying to not check social media uh, as much these days. I actually deleted my Facebook like over 10 years ago already. So that's been great. <laughs> Next step would probably be like, you know, you know, getting rid of Twitter or, you know, I don't know, whatever is gonna explode next. Um, and I think we still want information, right? So that's, that's the hard part. And I think there are many ways to do that. It's, I don't personally feel so dependent on social media and I know that we all feel very different about this. I mean, you know, I actually constantly have these discussions with my students <laughs> all the time. And I know it's also very different from generation to generation. Um, I think you have to do what works for you, um, but realize, but at least always realizing that that's not the entirety of, of the world. That is a very small part and it's potentially a very biased view of the world. And you need to get out there, you know, you need to interact with real people, you need to, um, check out actual news outlets, although I'm not sure if that's really helpful <laughs> either. But, you know, go out there and talk to people. And I think we're very lucky in a city like New York. At least you don't have to drive for like 20 miles to, you know, see the next person, right? There are plenty of people around you. Um, and participate in, you know, real sort of social events. Yeah. Um, I think we have time for one more question. It's here. Thank you. Um, hi, uh, I am currently doing a master's in psychology and I just want to say that the studies that you presented are so fascinating. Um, I have two questions. So in one of the studies you mentioned that you did it on, on college students. So I was wondering for the sample populations of these studies that you conducted, were they mostly in the United States? And I guess a follow up to that is, um, have you been able able to examine differences between individualistic versus collectivist cultures for what you yeah. presented. Yeah, these are great and questions. And then um, my second question is actually about chat GPT, which I think she mentioned. So I also have a strong interest in computational linguistics, and I was wondering, in your field of uh, computational psychiatry, like, is there going to be kind of a cross, right, using chat GPT to conduct studies? You have some studies you talked about, you know, there was a human aspect and computer aspect, but what if, like, use an AI instead mm -hmm. in the, um, I forgot the name of the, yep. yeah, the study that you mentioned. Okay, great. So the first question, um, so most of these studies were conducted in sort of like, a, you know, um, in the US setting. Um, you know, we actually do, s I mean, one, I think there was one or two studies that I showed were from like student populations, but um, actually, in more recent years, we're really trying not to do that, right? So we're, we're now really s trying to sample like what we call community samples. So, you know, like the average person really. And uh, actually, thanks to COVID, we were forced to move a lot of the research online. And, th and that way, we were able to recruit very large samples from across the country. Like we recruited actually 1,500 people 
during COVID to, particip to participate in the project. And from almost every single state you can imagine, we had coverage. So that was pretty good. And, um, you know, we didn't do sort of like cross-state cultural, but between countries, actually the lesion study I showed, um, the data was collected in China. And it, interestingly, the healthy controls there behave very similarly <laughs> to the American sort of healthy controls. And I think, like I said, that ultimatum game as a paradigm um, has been used in across many, many different cultures, uh, actually cross continents, Africa, you know, um, Australia, Europe, Asia, and you know, North America, South America. So, so at least some of the key findings are pretty consistent, right? That that a Universally, humans are sensitive to unfairness. I guess that's all I can say. Oh, of course, th with some subtle differences. Um, your second question, uh, yes, I'm very aware of this new field called computational psychiatry. Um, actually, uh, I'm directing a new research center at Mount Sinai called the Center for Computational Psychiatry. <laughs> <laughs> But um, so we are, maybe it's a good time to do a little advertisement. We're one of the first research centers of this kind, actually, um, in the US uh, and also, you know, uh, worldwide. And there, it is highly interdisciplinary, right? Like you said, you know, AI, machine learning, these big data analytics have brought a lot of insight to other areas of medicine. So why not also take that? Uh, to benefit mental health or psychiatry research. That's basically the thinking. And this field has been growing over the past decade, uh, one or two decades. And I think, you know, like I said, I, I really think um, it's gonna grow into something really amazing. So stay tuned. Let's hear it for Dr. Gu. Thank you so much <laughs> for the wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Gu, for the fantastic talk and answering so many questions. Um, thank you again to the Dana Foundation for supporting tonight's talk and bringing our wonderful speaker. And thank you, all you lovely people in the audience for coming and asking so many great questions. Um, we hope to see you back here in 2023. Hang out and have another drink, chat with each other, experience, um, participate in, in actual life as opposed to the life of online social media. <laughs> and um, this talk, that said, is being recorded. So tell all your friends. You can watch it online on um, the Dana Foundation's YouTube page in a, probably in a, within a week, a couple weeks, a few days. We will, we will let you know. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming, and, and thank you again. And we will see you in 2023. Happy holidays, everybody. <laughs>